Okay, so I'm, I'm going to make a start. Um, today, I'm going to talk about interfaces, and I'll begin with a question. So, supposing you looked at an interface in a transmission electron microscope, what would you see? So, an interface is a, is a boundary between two crystals. If you looked at it in a transmission electron microscope, what would you expect to see? So, you know, you've got two crystals in different um, orientations. <coughs> what would you expect? the structure of the boundary to look like. Uh, the boundary definitely would have different contrast from the crystals on either side, yeah? Uh, but any ideas about what structure you might see inside the boundary? Okay, well, that's good. We are going to discover that, all right? So, uh, what, what we'll do is uh, we'll start with a single crystal and create an interface, okay? So, we'll slice it into half and create an interface. Uh, so, this is a simple kind of an interface where we take a single crystal, we cut it in half and we tilt the two halves by an angle theta with respect to each other. So, this is called a tilt boundary, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, when I do that, when I cut it and I tilt, I'm left with a gap, right? You can see that uh, here, there is empty space and, you know, we know that we don't have that uh, inside our polycrystalline material. So, this shows you the structure of an edge dislocation. And if you look uh, carefully, these planes here are tilted with respect to each other, okay? And then we have this extra half plane. So, if I have a gap like this and I put an array of edge dislocations there, then that would fill up the space, right? And the number of dislocations that I have to put in depends on how much of a tilt I put on, on that crystal. So, <coughs> this is what uh, an interface uh, uh, geometrically would look like. So, we've got this uh, crystal one and the second crystal, and there's no gap here now. We've filled it up with uh, e extra half planes, which uh, basically fill up that wedge-shaped void <coughs> when we tilted one half with respect to the other. And because this is a tilt interface, a single single axis and a single rotation, uh, we only need one set of dislocations to accommodate the misfit between the two crystals. Okay, so the array of dislocations, the line vectors are poking into the plane of the board. And those dislocations will have a certain spacing uh, d. And you can see from the simple geometry here that if the dislocations have a Burgers vector b and their spacing is d, then we can relate that to the tilt angle theta by a straightforward equation that the tangent of theta upon 2 uh, is equal to the Burgers vector divided by twice the spacing of that array. And if theta is small, then, you know, theta will be proportional to, uh, or 1 upon d will be proportional to theta, okay? So, these dislocations will get closer and closer together if the angle theta is large. They are inversely proportional, okay? Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, when I asked the question, that you will see contrast from uh, the interface, right? So, you know, the contrast comes from the strain fields of the dislocation, yeah? So, if we look uh, at a uh, transmission electron micrograph, if you look very carefully, you can see <coughs> lines here. Can you see that? And those are arrays of dislocations. So, this is, this is a, what we call a weak beam image, where we have lit up only that crystal and uh, the rest of the matrix is not visible. And you can see arrays of dislocations here. That is the structure of the interface. That is what you see. And of course, uh, it's a simple interface that we've created because we have tilted by only one axis. In general, you know, you can describe uh, describe the misorientation between two crystals with three Euler angles. In other words, you know, you can 
put a general rotation and then uh, you may see more arrays of dislocations in the interface, non-parallel arrays of dislocations. Okay? But the contrast is coming from the fact that these dislocations have a strain field. And if I go back to this image, you know, you've got an extra half plane uh, for every dislocation. So the region here will be in compression because it shoved in an extra half plane, right? And the region underneath will be in tension. But if I put two edge dislocations on top of each other, then they will kind of compensate, won't they? Because the tension region is next to a compression region. So the effect of putting dislocations in arrays like this is to reduce the extent of the strain field approximately to the distance d. Okay? So the energy of the dislocation actually decreases. And you will get to a point where the angle theta is so large that you know the normal elasticity theory is no longer relevant because the cores of the dislocation start to overlap. Right? So this model of the interface is only relevant when the dislocations are sufficiently far apart to be recognized as dislocations. Right? They get too close to each other, you're introducing a lot of disorder into the boundary and it's basically an incoherent boundary. Okay? Okay, so you really can observe these dislocations in the transmission electron micrograph. You can even determine the Abergas vectors because um, you do a certain experiment in which the contrast from the dislocation completely disappears and from that information you can determine the Burgers vector. Okay, now the next thing to do uh, is to work out the energy of that interface. Um, we've got the energy of a dislocation per unit length. You familiar with this equation? What does the term WC stand for? You know, you, you divide your dislocation energy into two parts. One is due to the elastic strain field, and the other one due to the elasticity theory doesn't apply uh, to the region very close to the center of the dislocation, right? Because you know the displacements are large, so that's called the core energy. Okay, and uh, that's the core energy, and uh, G is the shear modulus, and B, B is the magnitude of the Burgers vector, and nu is the Poisson's ratio. So you're probably familiar with the equation that you know the energy is proportional to G B squared, right? Yeah. So thi this is the more sophisticated version of that. Uh, you've got the shear modulus, the magnitude of the Burgers vector, and in addition to the shear modulus, you need information about the Poisson's ratio. And the elastic strain field extends from the diameter of the core of the dislocation to infinity in this equation, but real crystals are not infinite in size. Uh, so if we just have a, a crystal, it will be the size of the crystal which gives you the upper limit of this uh, integral. Uh, but there is a catch. I explained to you that when we have arrays of dislocations, they compensate for each other's strain fields. Uh, a vertical array of edge dislocations will have the compression bit and the tension bits aligned. So really the strain field only extends roughly to the distance uh, of the spacing of the dislocations in the array. So R infinity can be set to the spacing uh, D. Um, this is just integrating R naught and we can set R infinity to to that uh, value. I just need to make this a bit bigger. So. Yeah, so uh, what, what you have is uh, an equation in which you have log of r infinity over r naught, and the form of that equation we'll simplify it to just uh, a constant a into a constant b times a into log of theta because from this equation if i set 
r infinity as d the spacing of this locations in the array then d and theta are inversely proportional. So, we can replace uh, r infinity with uh, 1 upon theta and that is why we have this minus sign in front of the log. Okay. So, you have the dislocation energy per unit length varying with log of the misorientation angle theta. Okay. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. The minus sign appears because r infinity is equal to d the spacing between the dislocations because they compensate for each other's strain field and d is proportional to 1 upon theta and therefore we have the minus sign in front of the log okay right so that's the energy per unit length of a dislocation in an array how do i work out then the energy per unit area of the interface Any ideas? So, we have got the energy of one dislocation in the array. How can I work out the energy per unit area? Sorry? Yeah. So, we need to know how many dislocations there are in a unit area. So, how many would there be? If, you know, they are extending, uh, uh, let us say, a meter into the depth of the material. So, I need to know how many dislocations there will be in the vertical direction or, or 1 upon d. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this is just a schematic of the strain field extending a distance d and r infinity we have set to uh, the spacing which is 1 upon theta and therefore, we end up with uh, this equation. And starting with that equation of energy per unit length the interfacial energy per unit area will be 1 upon d that means the number of dislocations in a unit length of interface normal to the dislocation line times the energy per unit length of the dislocation and we now have an equation uh, which tells us the interfacial energy per unit area of that tilt boundary that we started off with. So, that is quite a powerful result you know starting by uh, the fact that we can accommodate the misfit between two crystals in other words the gap that is left when I tilt the two crystals by showing in edge dislocations and a second physical principle that when we have an array of dislocations the strain field only extends approximately to the distance given by the separation of the dislocations okay? uh, not all the way to the size of the crystal. Uh, it is easy to work out the interfacial energy per unit area as the number of dislocations in a unit area of interface multiplied by the energy per unit length of those dislocations. Everyone happy with that? So, this is called the Reed equation <coughs> and if I, if I plot it, it looks uh, like this. So, ignore the dashed line for the moment. The interfacial energy increases continuously as a function of the misorientation theta and any idea why the slope is uh, decreasing. <coughs> the physical physical reason okay o obviously the equation gives you that <coughs> basically you know because as they get closer and closer together you know the strain fields are becoming vanishingly small okay. Uh, only the core energy becomes uh, important. Now, I have deliberately drawn uh, this curve uh, as the calculated interfacial energy per unit area, but it turns out that at certain values of theta, the energy sharply decreases. Okay? And uh, I have uh, simplified this, you might find many of these cusps in interface energy at particular values of theta. What, what happens is that as I vary the angle theta at certain orientations you get really good match between the two crystals and I am going to illustrate that and the way I will illustrate that is I will take the two crystals with sharing a common origin okay, and make them fill all space and then as we rotate you will see that at certain values of theta the lattice points from the two crystals uh, <coughs> 
or a certain fraction of the lattice points from the two crystals match exactly in space. Okay. Right. So here is a, a hexagonal lattice. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slice that in the plane of the board and rotate one half with respect to the other. Okay, now if you look at that, there are certain points where you get exact fit here, for example, between the crystal at the bottom and the crystal at the top. The light passing through the uh, image tells you where you get exact coincidence, right? Can you see that? Okay, and uh, if I continue, then those coincident points, for example, here and here, they actually form a pattern, right? So we'll call them coincidence uh, sites, uh, where the lattice points match exactly between the two crystals at a particular value of theta. And furthermore, they form a pattern, <coughs> which we call a coincidence site lattice. Okay. At those points, you've got perfect matching between the two crystals, even though they are not in the same orientation. Okay. So everyone happy with that? So it's possible at certain misorientations, to get perfect matching at a fraction of the lattice points. And those matching lattice points actually form a pattern by themselves, which we'll call a coincidence site lattice. <coughs> coincidence site lattice, or CSL for short. And of course, if we get good matching, then the properties of the boundary will also be different at those points. For example, uh, you know, we regard boundaries as easy diffusion paths, right? But if you've got good matching, there won't be easy diffusion paths. So at those orientations, uh, you will actually get a dramatic decrease in the diffusion coefficient in the boundary and other properties as well. <coughs> And uh, this is just uh, the same thing. Uh, there's a diagram I drew for you in your notes where you've got these two square lattices, um, the gray one and the orange one. And that's the common origin. And if I rotate, I'll find an angle where I can find a certain fraction of lattice points which are exactly coincident for the two different lattices. Okay. And you can see that the black uh, diagram is our coincidence site lattice for that particular misorientation between the two crystals. Okay. Everyone happy with that? So if I if I take uh, a lattice vector, um, where is my cursor? Yeah. If I take this uh, lattice vector of the CSL. That's also a lattice vector of the um, gray and orange lattices. Yeah. So in all three cases, you start at the origin and you end at the lattice point. Okay. Okay. And uh, this is just to show you how uh, experimental measurements of the interfacial energy per unit area. For in this case, it's a 110 tilt boundary. That means you're taking the two crystals and tilting them about the 110 axis. And you see these very sharp cusps in interfacial energy. I'll explain uh, the terminology uh, sigma 3. Sigma 3 means that one third of the lattice points are in coincidence. So a sigma 3 CSL means one third of lattice points coincident. <coughs> so would you expect a sigma three or a sigma five boundary to have a lower energy? Three, because you know a larger fraction of lattice points are coincident, right? And you can see that you know the sigma eleven 
boundary has a higher interfacial energy than sigma 3. When you get to you know very large values of sigma they are not terribly meaningful okay because the very a uh, very small fraction of lattice po points will be um, coincident. Okay, um, we can see that the angles here are quite large. All right, so the coincidence side lattice concept applies uh, beyond um, small angles. So you can think about this as the Reed equation up to here. Okay. Where you know we derive the equation giving us the interfacial energy as a function of dislocation density, uh, but then uh, we are getting coincidence, and therefore you have a cusp, and then the Reed equation kicks in again, but relative to the sigma three, okay, not the sigma zero, okay, or sigma one. Sorry, yeah, where everything is coincident. That means you have a single crystal, all right, a and so on. So all these segments are like the Reed equation, but applying from a different uh, starting point. Okay. So we now uh, can deal with uh, not just small misorientations, but large misorientations as well. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, mathematical treatment uh, to describe orientation relationships. That means. So far, I've talked about you know an axis, and we've rotated about it by theta to generate a, a second crystal. But we can express that uh, mathematically using very simple matrix methods. So you are familiar with this, that uh, you know we have a set of basis vectors a1, a2, and a3, and there's a, a vector u which we can express in terms of the basis vectors a1, a2, and a3, where u1, u2, u3 are the components of that vector. And for brevity, we'll refer to this particular set of basis vectors with the capital symbol A, because what I want to do is then uh, look at another uh, set of basis vectors for the second crystal, and we can call that B. So here, here we are. Um, we've got the basis A, and if I put two unit cells of the basis A next to each other, and this is my second crystal, which happens to be, you know, tetragonal in this case. B1 and B2 are equal, and B3 is not. So I've got the vector U, which is a physical entity. Yeah. So in other words, uh, its direction and its magnitude are not dependent on which coordinate system you choose, right? So if I refer the vector U to the basis A, then it will have components 1, 1, 1. Yeah, you can see that 1, 1, 1. But I refer it to basis B. It has different components. It doesn't have any uh, projection along B1. Okay. Uh, it's 2, B2, and 1, B3. Okay. So the components of the vector are different uh, in different coordinate systems. And you could say that the 0, 2, 1 direction in crystal B is parallel to the 1, 1, 1 direction in crystal A. That's how we express orientation relationships, that a particular direction is parallel and a particular plane is parallel between the two crystals. Okay. Everyone happy with that? But now, if I, <coughs> if I want to find what the 1, 2, 5 vector in B is equivalent to in A, how do I do that? Okay, so what we do is we start with the basis vectors. We express the basis vectors of the system A in terms of the system B. So A1, for example, which is this, is equal to B1 plus B2, right? Can you see that? So you write A1 is equal to 1B1 plus 1B2 plus 0B3. Uh, B2 is equal to a1, uh, sorry, um, this is B2. Ah, uh, sorry, uh, A2 is equal to minus B1 plus B2. Okay, can you see that? And A3 is equal to B3. So I've got a set of three vector equations, and all I've done in the next step 
is to express them uh, in matrix form. So, this equation here is exactly the same as the three equations because if I take B1 multiplied by 1, B2 multiplied by 1 and B3 by 0, I get the first equation B1 times minus 1 plus B2 times 1 plus B3 times 0 gives me the second equation and so on. And that matrix is our coordinate transformation matrix. Okay. So, I can now take that and convert the components of any vector in the basis B to any vector in the basis A or the other way around. Okay. Is everyone happy with that? Uh, now, in this particular case, the volume of the two cells is not identical. Okay. Um, so, the determinant of that matrix actually gives you the ratio of volumes. All right. But if the two basis systems were exactly identical, but in different orientations, then the determinant would be 1. Okay. There is no volume change. So, this is the equation that you would use that if I have a vector in the basis u uh, in the basis a the, and I multiply it by that matrix then I will get its components in the basis b. Now, this is uh, another system where uh, you know the basis vectors are identical for the two crystals just in different orientations. In other words, this is a pure rotation matrix. So, I want to find the components of one of the vectors uh, basis A in the basis B and here we are the vector A 1 in the basis B if I this is uh, A 1 will have uh, a component along 1 0 0 B of cos 45. Yeah, can you see that these are these are unit vectors now. So, cos 45 and uh, with respect to this one it will be minus sine 45 and so on. So, our matrix transforming these two uh, is straightforward and every row and every column of this uh, if I take the sum of squares of the um, if I take the sum of squares of cos 45 sine 45 and 0 it will be 1 and similarly cos 45 minus sin 45 0 squared will be 1 okay because this is just a rotation matrix <coughs> everyone happy with that yeah okay this is just to show you that if i take uh, a vector um, in the basis u, uh, sorry, in the basis A, then its components in the basis B are, are different, all right, because the two bases are um, oriented differently. But when I work out the magnitudes of the two vectors, they must come out as exactly the same because a vector is a physical entity. All we are doing is transforming its components from one system to the other. <coughs> Okay. Um, this is a particularly um, the two examples that I've given you are particularly easy to directly derive the uh, coordinate transformation matrix. Yeah, we can look at the components of A one along B two, and just by inspection, write down the matrix. But in general, they won't be nicely oriented where one of the axes uh, from both of the crystals are parallel. So, how do I say that? Look, if I have a rotation of 21 degrees, about 3, 2, 1, then what would be my rotation matrix? Okay. Well, um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but what you do is you take, for example, this rotation matrix and you transform it into a completely arbitrary set of axes. Okay. So, I pre and post multiply this by a completely arbitrary rotation matrix and then that gives me the most general rotation matrix between two 
orthonormal coordinate systems where u1, u2, u3 are the um, direction cosines of the axis of rotation. In other words, the axis of rotation is expressed as a unit vector and theta is the right-handed angle of rotation about that axis. <coughs> if anyone is interested in the proof of this, and I don't recommend it, I've got about three pages of it, all right? then I can give it to you. And of course, this is not a memory exercise, so you wouldn't be expected to remember this. Uh, the terms n and m are your uh, angle, uh, sine and cos of the angles of rotation. And if you look at this matrix carefully, then the trace of the matrix will be 1 plus 2 cos theta. That means j11 plus j22 plus j33 will give you the rotation angle. And uh, you can derive from that matrix uh, the axis of rotation as well, bearing in mind that u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u3 squared is 1. So this would be a general rotation matrix, and if you go to your scanning electron microscope and you're looking at the orientations between the two crystals, it can give you this information. Okay? So from that information, you can derive uh, the axis and angle, if that's what you're interested in, and so on. But the principle is exactly the same, that, you know, the column of this matrix represents the components of the basis vector of x in the basis y, exactly the same as we derived by inspection. Okay, so I emphasize again, I don't expect you to remember this, all right? Okay, now going back to our coincidence uh, site lattice, um, I said to you that this is a lattice vector between, um, between a lattice vector of the CSL, and it's also a lattice vector of your orange lattice and a lattice vector of your gray lattice. All right, and um, that means its components are integers. Okay, this is a primitive lattice that I've drawn. Its components are integers. You know, it'll be like. 2, 1 in the case of the gray lattice and 1, 2 in the case of the orange lattice and just uh, 1, 0, 0 in the case of the coincidence side lattice. So if I have a rotation matrix describing the orientation between the gray and the orange lattices and if I multiply it by a vector which is a vector equivalent to the coincident side lattice. That means, for example, in this case, uh, it will be 2, um, <coughs> 1, 2. Then I should get an integer integral vector, all right? So if I'm given a rotation matrix like this, okay, um, if I find a factor which converts everything inside the matrix into an integer and I take it out, like the one-third over there, then that gives me the sigma value. The inverse of that gives me the sigma value. So if I give you a rotation matrix and you can find a common factor which converts everything inside that rotation matrix into an integer, then one upon that common factor will give you the sigma value. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Simply because the coincidence side lattice vector must uh, must have integers. Okay. So it's very easy just by looking at the rotation matrix to get the sigma value. And on your scanning electron microscope where we do uh, this electron backscatter diffraction, it often, uh, you can ask it to give you the sigma values between two adjacent crystals. And all it does is it works out the rotation matrix, finds the common factor and gives you a sigma value. And bear in mind that as we go to larger and larger sigma values, they are not really important because the fraction of coincidence points, uh, which are common, will be too small to have a significant effect on the boundary. Everyone happy with that? So, you know, in, in a very short time, actually, we've covered uh, an incredible amount of knowledge about boundaries, okay? 
you know, you learned for the first time that the structure of a boundary consists of dislocations, and you can see those dislocations in a transmission electron microscope, work out the Burgers vectors. You can estimate uh, the spacing that you should see between the dislocations given a Burgers vector, and you can work out the interfacial energy per unit area uh, for small values of theta. But that at certain misorientations, uh, you will get coincidence between the two lattices, and at those misorientations, the interfacial energy diffusion coefficient, etc., will be dramatically affected. And when we introduce texture into the material by particular kinds of deformation, the probability of getting uh, coincidence site lattices increases, okay, because the crystals rotate in a way that will minimize the interfacial energy. Okay, so, if you introduce uh, low sigma values, then you are actually reducing the total interfacial energy per unit area, uh, even though you know the total amount of interface may not be decreasing. You are introducing more low energy interfaces than high energy. And you can also express the misorientation between two crystals in terms of uh, a rotation matrix, which has an axis angle pair or Euler angles, they are all equivalent, right? So, given a rotation matrix, you can also derive the Euler angles, I haven't gone into that, but they are equivalent descriptions. And to express the orientation relationship, there are only three variables. <coughs> You've got uh, an axis, a unit axis of rotation, and an angle. So, why does that make give you three? You know, you've got u1, u2, u3, and theta. Why isn't it four? Because you know it's a unit vector, right? So u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u2 squared 3 squared is 1. So only two components are uh, necessary to specify, and the angle theta. So that's the orientation relationship. You might need another axis to specify the normal to the interface. So there's a total of five independent components to describe an interface. OK, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I'm impressed with how much we have learned, okay?